Uh, so it's a little bit later in the day, so I will have to keep my voice down a little bit because I believe someone in the house is sleeping. Uh, so uh, I'll get straight to it. I'll get to the point. Uh, the Time 26 frigate, or the City Class frigate, is one of the new frigates being implemented as a replacement for the Type 23. So the program is known as Global Combat Ship, and it was launched by the MOD in order to get rid of or replace these 23 frigates alongside the other programs, uh, Type 31 frigates and Type 32 frigates, but uh, Type 26, I would say probably the most important of those three, um, as well as being sort of the first chronologically. So it was first sort of given the go ahead in 2017 when the UK or the Royal Navy rather, or the MOD rather, said that they would commission three ships to be built. Um, but anyway, I'm going to just sort of do a bit of an overview of it and talk about it a little bit and its capabilities. So, as I've said, it's called the Type 26 Frigate, but it's also called the City Class for this general purpose uh, super frigate. Um, it's built by BAE Maritime, and BAE, as I've discussed, has quite, quite a wide range of naval products. Uh, and it's operated currently by the Royal Navy, the Royal Australian Navy, and the Royal Canadian Navy. So, I believe, in regard to what's planned, the UK, the Royal Navy, has agreed to purchase eight uh, units of these frigates. The Australian, or the Royal Australian Navy, has agreed to purchase nine of these frigate units, and the Canadian Royal Navy, or the Royal Canadian Navy, I'm not quite sure which it is, has agreed to purchase, I think, 15 of these units. Um, but in any case, it is being exported. So the UK variant, the one that's been sold to the Royal Navy, costs 1.23 billion as of 2017 for these first three units. Uh, for Australia, it's going to cost 35 billion in total for their nine units and for Canada, um, but that is in Australian dollars. Um, for Canada, it will cost 69.8 eight billion for 15 units and that's in Canadian dollars. Uh, so in regard to what its general characteristics are for this city class frigate, its main role is anti-submarine warfare uh, as frigates are notorious for as well as sort of auxiliary support and uh, it's got various pretty strong capabilities as I say it is a super frigate. So in regard to propulsion, I mean it's a reason reasonably sized frigate anyway but it's got not only uh different propulsion systems which can be used in tandem but it's got different optional propulsion systems so not all of the systems have to be used simultaneously uh which gives one you know slight slightly more adaptability so it's got one rolls-royce mt30 gas turbine uh and the classical four uh, high-speed diesel generators. That's exactly what you'd expect. Uh, and two electric motors. So the diesel and the electric, that's sort of perhaps not something brand new, but it's innovation which is seen more nowadays as you have uh, further use of electric motors rather than pure reliance on uh, fuel burning, uh, diesel, I guess you'd say, utilisation. In regard to speed, it can go in excess of 26 knots, which is about 30 miles per hour, perhaps a little bit more, um, and it has a 7,000 nautical mile range in sort of this electric motor drive, which is what it's going to try to rely on. In regard to boats and landing craft carried, it's got two. It has uh, a crew, or it, it is operated by a, cu a crew of 150, 157 technically, um, with capacity for 208 crew members. 
It doesn't have 4D radar, only 3D, uh, sorry, 3D radar, which is the Type 997 uh, Artisan. Uh, I think that's by Kelvin Hughes, uh, Sharp Eye Navigation Radar, uh, and then Termoscanter 6000, which is only a 2D uh, radar. But nonetheless, that combination, those dual radar capabilities, give it, you know, pretty decent sensor capabilities. In regard to sonar, it's got sonar 2087, which is a towed array sonar. So because, you know, this is a specialized submarine hunting frigate, uh, it's not, it can be used as general purpose, but it is really quite specialized at that. Its sonar is incredibly potent. So it utilizes uh, ultra electronics type 2150 bow sonar, uh, and then for satellite communication, it's got what you'd expect, pretty much. But it does have, you know, considering it's designed to hunt submarines, pretty potent radar capability. It's got all of the classical sort of uh, electronic warfare decoys. In regard to armament, I find this quite impressive because it has uh, sort of dual capabilities, I guess you could say. It's an excellent, it's an excellent submarine hunter, certainly but it also has incredible auxiliary value to be used for land attack, ship attack. Um, it has major anti-air capabilities. So I'll just talk about that for a minute. So it's got two times 24 cells for basically 48 uh, Sea Scepter anti-air missiles, which is, you know, that's those missiles are pretty much at the forefront of anti-air innovation. In regard to anti-ship missiles, it's got uh, sort of one 24 cell unit uh, and for the anti-air VLS, just to say, you, you have sort of forward and aft uh, dual unit setup so that you don't compromise all anti-air capability if one is hit or incapacitated or under maintenance. Um, in regard to anti-ship capabilities, it's got one 24-cell Mark 41 uh, VLS system which can use sort of classical tomahawks, it can use pr pretty much any uh, anti-ship missile the UK has uh, or the Royal Navy is currently utilising, but the important part of this is that it can also utilise uh, future cruise or anti-ship missiles. So in regard to what we're sort of seeing upcoming, innovation in the field is allowed. Uh, so. <clears throat> While these are expensive units, and I've talked about that before, um, they do seem to be here for the long haul. They seem to be, <coughs> excuse me, incredibly potent in that regard. Uh, and they seem to be set up in a manner that allows implementation of future technologies. And that is largely the focus. And so its modularity largely comes from its ability to integrate future technologies rather than its changeability like the Type 31 or Type 32. Uh, in regard to the guns it has, each unit, or so far, has one 5-inch uh, 62 caliber Mark 45 naval gun, which is potent, um, two 30mm thir guns, which are uh, DS-30M Mark II guns, two Phalanx Seawiss for uh, defense, as you'd expect, two miniguns, uh, and four general purpose machine guns. And that's sort of, you know, as you'd expect, that's fairly typical uh, for this sort of frigate plan that has such auxiliary power. Um, in regard to aircraft, aircraft are interesting. So what we've seen with frigate innovation is that aircraft, uh, helicopters, rotary wing aircraft, they are here to stay and their role in anti-submarine warfare is, it's been proven to be massively valuable. Uh, and due to this, the Type 26 has accommodation for two helicopters. And because it is the Royal Navy, those will either be Wildcat or uh, Augusta Westland Merlin. And on those, you will either have anti-ship missiles or submarine torpedoes, anti-submarine torpedoes. So 
at the moment, I would assume they'd use Sea Venom for anti-ship because that's the main uh, helicopter launched anti-ship missile. And I think that's also by MDBA, as many missiles are. Um, and then Stingray, which is the sort of front running uh, anti-submarine torpedo, as opposed to, I think, Spearfish's anti-ship uh, torpedo. I think I got that wrong in another video anyway. Uh, and that's for the Wildcat. The Merlin can carry four Stingray anti-submarine torpedoes. So what you're going to see is if they choose to specialise more in anti-submarine warfare, the increased use of the Merlin for these, uh, for its increased torpedo capacity, or if it's a more versatile role, you need the Wildcat, realistically. Uh, what I also sort of touched on in a prior video is the use of Marlot multi-role uh, air-to-surface missiles, which may be used on, I think, just the Wildcat, but that's also going to make it more adaptable uh, and perhaps not focus on the idea of modularity, but certainly focus on the idea of adaptability for auxiliary roles, which is going to be essential if these frigates are here to stay. In regard to aviation facilities, this is really where this Super Frigate shines. Um, not only does it have two aircraft, which are going to be massively helpful for submarine warfare, but it's got a large Chinook-capable flight deck, uh, as I believe Type 31 has, as Type 45 has, um, the destroyer. Uh, but it's also got this enclosed hangar and facilities for UAVs. And what one can expect to see with that as well is the sort of uh, implementation of storage space in order to maintain these UAVs and increase battle space capabilities. What we're seeing in regard to Type 32, or at least speculation on Type 32, is its potential use as, I believe they call it the drone mothership. You get this interconnected... Uh, sort of hive of activity, and this certainly comes into play when talking about, uh, you know, the implementation of Concept 1 or 2 drones, uh, the Future Technologies, BAE Systems drones, uh, UASs even. What we can see is sort of future adaptability for more of a Nexus role. So frigates are going to play a major role in the communication of technology in their auxiliary role, as well as in submarine uh, hunting, attacking, tracking. Uh, what else we have is specialist classes. So the class I just talked about was the city class in regard to the hunter class, which is... It is slightly different, although the only thing we're manufacturing at the moment is the city class. It takes on more of an anti-ship role, uh, more of an auxiliary role, despite uh, city class's pretty incredible auxiliary capabilities. So, in comparison, it's uh, it has the same propulsion as city class. It can go 27 plus knots. It's got the same range as the city class, it needs 180 personnel with the same maximum accommodation of 208. Uh, it does have different sensors, though. So in regard to the underwater warfare for submarine hunting, it's going to probably take more of a tracking capability rather than the actual attack capability. It has better ship attack qualities. So. It uses the Ultra S2150 hull-mounted sonar, the Thales Sonar 2070 towed array, uh, variable depth, which is the same as the City class. But for uh, command and control, it's got the Aegis. Again, I, I'm going to get, I'm going to butcher this. I never know how to pronounce it. Aegis uh, combat system and the Saab 9LV tactical interface. So it's going to take on more of this central role as an auxiliary frigate, perhaps not going off and hunting submarines, but being the information uh, hub. And for surveillance and 
weapon sensors. It uses the CEA Technologies uh, phased array radar, which is fairly typical, or is probably going to be fairly typical of frigates from now on, uh, that are performing these general purpose Nexus roles. So you might expect that of Type 32. Uh, in regard to armaments, it has uh, more anti-ship missile capability. So it's got 32 cell Mark 41 VLS, which, you know, Ma uh, Mark 41 VLS is generally what's implemented, which fires RIM-66 Standard 2 and RIM-162 ESSM. And then for torpedoes, it's got the MU-90 impact torpedoes, which are, you know, all of those missiles and torpedoes are inherently anti-ship. It's got same Mark 45 uh, gun, but it's dual purpose, Mod 4, uh, as well as two 30mm short-range gun systems, two phalanx, as you'd expect. Uh, and the aircraft is different, so I'm not really sure how this would be implemented, but they're talking about using the Romeo Seahawk, armed with uh, Mark 50, two Mark 54 Mako torpedoes and four AGM 114 Hellfire missiles, which takes on certainly a more versatile, uh, more adaptive role, uh, and it can carry two uh, rotary wing aircraft, and it's got effectively the same aircraft capabilities as uh, the City class, but as I say, is slightly different. So there is another variant, the Canadian surface combatant, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to stick to the Royal Navy variant. Uh, this is just sort of an overview, so I might talk a bit more about Type 26 at a later date. Thank you.